great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Larry Scott, well-known historian. gave it up to me to, <laughs> to do, and he's also serving as a member of our board of directors right now, but Larry's been very involved in the historical society for many years and offers many good, fascinating, and enchanting stories about the life and history of the lot. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it off to Larry. Comedians used to say, save it for the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm really thrilled tonight. I'm quite intimidated, to tell you the truth, because there's so many uh, members of Ms. Ash's family here, uh, and uh, uh, grandchildren, great grandchildren, and nephew, and uh, here I am trying to tell something about this wonderful lady and they don't know all about her and I ought to turn the program over to them. Let me begin by telling a little family story of my own. I have three lovely daughters and uh, one of them, when she was a little girl, used to whine a lot and uh, so my wife was out shopping with her one day and she was hanging around my wife's leg and whining and what and kind of generally being a nuisance and one of the neighbors came up trying to talk to my wife and the little girl wouldn't let them have much of a conversation so they broke it up and went on. A few days later, my wife was again in, a, in the grocery store with this same little girl and here came this neighbor again trying to talk to her and she looked down at the little girl and she said, oh no, not you again. <laughs> And as I came to the podium, I think I heard that big <laughs> <laughs> Not you again. <laughs> Let me set the scene for you. Uh, I'm 85 years old. I was born in 1928, and the uh, stock market crashed in 1929. So I'm really a child of the Great Depression of the 30s. And uh, all of us, you know, had a real hard time growing up uh, in those days, but one of the greatest thrills of my childhood in, in Atlanta was going to the movies. And uh, there was an Empire Theater uh, about two miles from where we lived, and we used to walk over there every Saturday morning, and for 10 cents, we could be transported to another world for a couple of hours. Uh, we just loved uh, Charles Starrett, Lash LaRue, Buck Jones, Tim McCoy, Ken Maynard, Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, and of course, Hopalong Cassidy. There was always a cartoon, movie tone news, which was the eyes and ears of the world, and a serial or chapter picture. Now these were movies that were divided into 12 parts, and each Saturday you would see one exciting chapter, which ended with a cliffhanger, ensuring that you would be back the next Saturday to see what happened. Some of you may remember the shadow. The cliffhanger. Bob Rogers in the 21st century. The clutching hand. These stories were very exciting and would end with things like the whole wall of the room with a thousand daggers sticking out and closing in on the hero. Sure death. And they would leave you there until the next Saturday when you would come back to see how the hero got out of that situation. And so it would open with the walls closing and him looking around. And all at once he would find a convenient tube before and put it down and stop the wall. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, that was just a, a great way to spend a Saturday morning. And in those days... The movies ran continuously. So if you went in, you could just sit there for an hour, another hour, two hours, however long you wanted to, and watch them over and over again. What was it? It was just really an exciting kind of a time. But what about the folks who didn't live in Atlanta with a the movie theater within walking distance of their home? What about the kids who lived in a place like Dahlonega, Georgia? Their salvation came in the person of Randall Holly Brannon, an entrepreneur who had a 16-millimeter movie projector. 
and he toured the counties of North Georgia, bringing movies to the folks in the Blue Ridge Mountains. He came to Dahlonega and arranged to show a movie on Saturday night in the high school auditorium. Enter Mrs. Lula Ash. Mrs. Ash was president of the PTA, and when she heard that part of the proceeds from the movie were going to the PTA, she willingly agreed to take up tickets for the performance. The people in the area looked forward to these Saturday night movies, and they became very popular. People would walk in from miles and miles out in the country to Saturday night movies after school. Well, Mr. Brannon decided then to open uh, a theater of his own. And uh, he uh, opened it uh, in downtown Dahlonega. He rented space in the Price Building, uh, which is on the south side of the square. And today that's where the Picnic Cafe is uh, located. He put in a ticket booth. He put in double doors for entry and exit and a large marquee with the words, Holly Theater in large neon letters. And of course, he asked Mrs. Lula Ash to continue her role as the ticket taker. But who was Lula Ash? Well, she was born Lula Hughes in Union County and at age 21 was a teacher in a rural county school. She attended a teacher's meeting in Blairsville, where she met a gentleman named Wesley L. Ash, who was a professor uh, of English at North Georgia Agricultural College in Delanago. Mr. Ash was a widower with two young children, and he was several years older than Lula. He and Lula began a correspondence, and it wasn't long before he hitched up his buggy and went over the mountains to claim Lula Hughes for his bride. Mr. Ash started the graded schools in Dahlonega and served as principal of the school for five years. He served as mayor of Dahlonega and was a county commissioner. <coughs> he passed away in 1929, leaving Lula Ash with seven children under the age of 15 to raise by herself. Well, the family had a large house down on Park Street and although she would have loved to have a beautiful garden there, Miss Ash allowed her boys to use the yard as the local ball field. <laughs> the family loved living on Park Street, and the children attended the local public school on the hill at the end of the street. The building was a large barn-like building that was hot in the summer and cold in the winter. The ground school children were on the lower floor, the high school children on the second floor. When Hughes Ash, that's one of Miss Ash's boys, graduated from North Georgia Agricultural College at age 19, he became principal of the school. He wrote the school's alma mater song, and that song today is still the alma mater of Lumpkin County School. He got permission from the Board of Education to start the school's first basketball team. He later served for 34 years in the United States Army, and listen to this, he was the first graduate of North Georgia College to achieve the rank of Brigadier General. Wow. The family was so proud of that achievement. And I knew Louise, she went to my church, and she told me about it, and she said to me this, running the theater was not Mama's only outstanding compliment. She did some pretty famous things, too, like raising a Brigadier General. <laughs> Lula Ash loved being the ticket lady at Mr. Brown's Theater on the Square. She enjoyed meeting the people from town uh, as well as those from out in the country. Her daughters, Louise and Virginia, sold popcorn and Cokes in the lobby, and Robert Ash, one of her sons, who was only 12 at the time, ran the projector. Now, how's that for a family affair? <laughs> Some of these ladies up here, granddaughters and great-granddaughters, got involved in that too, and they'll take you back a little bit later. <laughs> Mr. Brown had kept a room at the Smith House, but he traveled back and forth to Roswell, where he had 
another theater. More and more he became to depend on Mrs. Ash to run the theater for him. They had one movie on Monday and Tuesday, a different movie on Wednesday, another movie on Thursday and Friday, and Saturday, of course, was the Western. The movies came in by bus, and sometimes Mr. Brown brought them in himself. The movies were usually six to seven re reels well, per movie, but when Gone with the Wind came in, guess how many reels? Thirteen. <laughs> Thirteen. The building next door to the theater uh, was the Old Eagle Hotel. It had long since stopped being used as a hotel and was being rented by North Georgia College as a men's dormitory called Moore Hall. One night, the old hotel caught fire and burned just like a cracker box. It was a total loss, but the brick wall of the Price Building where the theater was located spared the theater. However, there was damage to the roof of the building as well as to the screen and some of the interior. It was said that one of the firemen had seen too many movies and he thought the only way to fight a fire was to chop a hole in the roof and let the smoke out. <laughs> Water came in and did damage to uh, the Holly Theater. The projectionist at that time was a young man named Robert Hightower and he ran inside the building and single-handedly carried out the movie projector. After the fire was out, he found he was unable to even lift it off the ground, and he could not figure out how in the world he had gotten it out of that burning building. Well, uh, with the theater on the square badly damaged, Mr. Browning decided to build a theater of his own down on West Main Street, uh, right down from the public square, the location of the present Holly Theater, which opened in July of 1948 and was really state of the art. Manny Cavallo found this July 18, 1948 edition of the Zalonica Nugget at our old jail museum. We're going to pass it around so you can see uh, the holly when it opened up and you can peek at some of the stories. Lots of interesting things going on in uh, Zalonica in 1948. The first movie was The Bride Grows Wild with uh, June Allison. Well, uh, the theater was really something to see. It had a white marble facade, beautiful interior design with a brick wall covered with rich fabric, a motorized curtain, and two projectors. And of course, <laughs> Mr. Brown could not operate it without having Mrs. Lula Ash as his manager. And she loved the new theater and treated it just like it was her very own. She still worked the ticket booth and enjoyed interaction with the public. She knew many people to whom she sold a ticket could ill afford to do it, but she also felt that people needed a little entertainment and recreation to brighten their lives. Tickets were 25 cents for adults, 10 cents for children under 12. A lot of what I'm telling you tonight came from one of Ann Amerson's wonderful books, I Remember Delonica, Volume 2. And a lot of it came from people who knew Mrs. Ash that I talked to personally. One of those was Roy Gibson. He's way up high in his 60s now. Runs a TV and satellite service here in town. His dad was one of the sheriffs, Jack uh, Gibson, I believe. We have his picture down at the old jail, and Roy spent some of his teenage years living at the old jail. He said for about four months after he became 12 years of age, Miss Ash would still let him get in for 10 cents on salary. <laughs> Finally, she said to him, Gibson, I think you better find a porter before you come to the theater next time. <laughs> Doesn't sound just like her. Bryce and Wilkins, who many of you know, around town, another entrepreneur, buying and selling things all the time, and he and his sister, Loretta, were the queen of the gold rush uh, a few years back. Here's what he told me. He said, we lived in a, oh, one funny thing he said, he said, I had to drop out of school in the third grade. I said, why was that, Bryson? 
He said, well, Daddy was in the third day grade. He didn't want me to pass it. <laughs> That's just right. <laughs> he said, we lived in a little rundown house right next door to the theater. And he said, I was just a dirty little boy in ragged clothes and no shoes. And I would sneak up a fire escape to the door up there. And one of my friends would crack open the door and let me in. And he said, you know, I know Miss Ash knew exactly what was going on. I never tried to stop me. Isn't that a sweet story? I just love that. He said, uh, anyway, he said, she felt sorry for us poor youngins and didn't try to stop me from going in. When he grew up, he eventually was able to lease the Holly Theater from the Brownlands and run it for several years himself. Now that's a story that can only happen in America. Isn't that true? What it was said that if a drunk came up to the ticket booth and tried to buy a ticket, Miss Ash would just smile at him so sweetly and say, you know, I sure am sorry. All the seats are so bad. <laughs> she was very protective of the Holly and walked the aisles regularly with her flashlight to be sure that no one was putting their feet on the seat in front of them. She didn't to put up with too much ardent lovemaking in the back row <coughs> and would shake the big bunch of keys she carried at those who were hugged up a little bit too tight. <laughs> the boys used to say they knew when she was coming by the jingle of those keys as she walked and they would break it up before she got there. One of them told me that just put your arm on the back of the seat like this, not around the girl, just on the seat. And she'd shake those keys at <laughs> I heard one of the cadets say that he was walking on the campus on hands with his girlfriend and they caught him over there on the campus and he was put on a week's punishment digging tree stumps just for holding hands. All the good old days. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, Ms. Ash did that in a very sweet and kind of motherly way, and uh, she didn't try to embarrass anybody about it. She just shaked those keys, and you knew uh, that was enough. And it was said that a lot of times when a girl, a boy, got engaged, uh, Ms. Ash was the first one that come to the show their engagement ring to. And uh, the alumni would come back to town for visits and they would go by the theater to see Ms. Ash. They all loved and respected her. One of my dearest friends, Johnny Walker, passed away a few years ago at age 89. And this is what Johnny said. He and his wife, Edna, were married for 60 years, but they've been married about 40 years. <clears throat> they were in the Holly Theater. And so Johnny said to Edna, Edna, I tell you what, let's do. Let's hook up real tight and just hold it. And when Miss Ash comes by and shakes those keys, let's don't move up, but move these. Let's just keep on. <laughs> he said, his wife pulled back and she said, Johnny Walker, we'll do no such thing. And you behave yourself. <laughs> <laughs> when the day was over, Miss Ash would take the receipts from the day's uh, uh, business at the theater, stick it in her pocketbook, and brought, walk home. She lived from the Holly down to Park Street. The banks didn't have night deposits in those days, but nobody ever bothered her. Most people did not even lock their doors then and had no fear of walking. She had no fear of walking home with that money. And Mr. Brown said, <coughs> If anybody tries to take that money from you, you let them have it. Don't try any heroics. But no one ever bothered her, and she follows that practice for years and years and years. When the first Gold Rush Festival was started in 1954, they elected a king and queen of the Gold Rush. Mr. Brown put an ad in the Dahlonega Nugget that said, Dahlonega may have its king and queen of the Gold Rush, but Lula Ash is queen of the Holly." Everybody felt that way about her. Well, when TV started getting popular in the 1950s, attendance at the Holly dropped off very seriously. And this bothered Lula Ash, and for years and years, she refused to have a television in her home. She loved the Holly with all her heart, and anything that affected the Holly affected her. 
She remained the manager of the Holly Theater until she was 70 years old. She lived to be 94. Even today, when her name is mentioned, old timers will smile and tell a favorite memory about her, and they all agreed with Mr. Brown. She was indeed the queen of the Holly. I want to give the family a chance now to tell some stories firsthand of this lovely, wonderful lady. Wasn't she interesting? People just loved her, and they just always. and tell anything you'd like to about your grandmother. We've had our nephew to speak already, but we want to know more tonight about Lula, and we're just so delighted that you're here. Yes, yes, please do. I feel at home behind the podium. Okay, I just want you all to know that her children are still here pictures and articles and little sayings all pasted in the magazine. And I would be wondering, well, why is she doing that? Well, one year she explained to me, well, you know, back in the 20s and the 30s, we didn't have scrapbooks. So we had to use what we could, and I would get a magazine, and that magazine, every year, I would paste what I wanted to keep. So she had what I call that poem where she sang to, and that happened to be the alma mater. And when my <coughs> daddy wrote it, he came and gave it her, the original, and she pasted it in there and he said, this will always be a tribute to you. He absolutely adored his mother. He was the oldest of seven, and when his dad died, I think he was 14, she wanted him to assume the role of the man in the house. Well, you can imagine what a 14-year-old but he graduated from college when he was 19, so he probably pretty well handled the problem. Excuse, excuse me, could you, could you introduce your, could you tell me your name okay. so I can get it on tape? All right, I'm Tommy Ash Ward. Thank you. Uh -huh. okay. um, my name is Karen Kuhn, and um, my mother was Helen Ash, one of the three daughters. Of, of Miss Ash, and I remember Delonica so fondly coming up in the summertime and, and getting to go to the movies. That's my uh, memory is that I could go at night and go to work. We called her E. Ash, and we're not sure, maybe one of the children started that, maybe Granny Ash, but it somehow ended up being E. Ash, and that's what all her grandchildren called her. Uh, but what was great and my fondest memory is seeing all those movies three and four times. And I will sometimes, if I catch an old movie on TV, I sometimes know the dialogue. You know, in the, the old imitation of life with Lana Turner. I believe that ran a whole week. And I saw that recently and I, I told my niece, you've got to watch this movie because I remember it so fondly from the Holly. And sure enough, I knew the dialogue. And it's just, just a great memory. But um, I do want to mention Mr. Brannon. They were great friends, and, but they always used Mr. Brannon and Mrs. Ash. Even though they were very, very close friends there also. I had that little formality <coughs> among them. But um, it was great. You know, that Mr. Brannon brought just a little touch of Hollywood to these two tiny towns to Roswell and Delonica. Um, my connection to the Holly is where, you know, during World War II, of course, Delonica was hopping with all the young men who were uh, sent to college in North Georgia. And my father was one of those. He uh, was a Yankee from Chicago and waited till he got drafted. He did not run off and join. So he, uh, the Army, drafted him and sent him to college at North Georgia. 
and um, turns out Mrs. Ash was a wonderful cook, and the hottest invitation for the cadets was to Mrs. Ash's house for dinner because not only was she a wonderful cook, but she also had three daughters, Helen, Virginia, and Louise. So, I, but my father married one of those daughters. He married Helen. So I just have such such fond memories, and it's just so wonderful um, to be here with all of you and that you're interested in my little grandmother. Thank you. Stand up and let us see who you are. I have to admit I'm a little striking at her picture because I think I look like her. <laughs> <laughs> um, Miss Ash was my great grandma. My grandfather was Jock. Um, Mom would tell stories, so that's how I knew her. Obviously, I never got to meet her. She passed away before I was born. My oldest brother did get to meet her one time. And she, I don't know why she was at that point. But my mom said, Miss Ash always told them that whenever you said the word Ash, you better cover your heart. <laughs> so all of my life, every time I spoke of an Ash, I covered my heart. <laughs> I wasn't really sure why. But my mom said I better do it because her grandma said to do it. So I don't. <laughs> but um, it's, it's nice to see that I have family. You know, I don't necessarily know you all, but we're still family. And, um, Thank you for a wonderful presentation about her. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. And what is your Thank name? You, would you like I to am say? Victoria Loggins. Would you like to say something further about your aunt? Yes, I would. All right. Come up and tell us something about her. We, we all just fell in love with her, so we want to hear more and more. I fell in love with her, too. <laughs> uh, like I said, I'm Bud Agins from Blair. I'm the president of the Historical Society at Blair. And uh, I got a picture of Aunt Lou Ash's father. I'll uh, pass it around and look at it. Wait, hold it up first. Hold it up, bud. Hold it up. Uh, hold it up, bud. They're going to pass it around. Everybody I look at it. Oh, you want to look at it? Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead. He's going to shoot the camera. Go ahead. Go to the camera. <laughs> uh, that's, his name was Uncle Tom Coke Hughes. Everybody called him Uncle Tom Coke Hughes. But he was my great grandfather. And by the way, I have my wife with me, Mary Carol Akins, and Martha Ann Cohn and her sister Ruth. Uh, their, their mother was also a half-sister to Aunt Lou Ash, as well as, as my grandmother right here was a half-sister. Uh, so uh, Uncle Tom Coe Hughes there, he died in 1935, and, and, that, and I was born in 38, and... <coughs> I sure wish it had been reversed, but I'd like to have known him. My grandmother said that me and him would have got along good. He was a officer in the Civil War, and uh, then he was also a Methodist preacher, and uh, he was called a circuit riding preacher on a mule. And he lived in Union County. Uh, Martha Ann used to own the old farm. She owns the farm where they're all raised over there. And... Uh, <clears throat> So he would ride that mule sometimes on a Saturday afternoon, go to town scouting, preach the next day. And he told his wife, he said, well, I'm going up to town scouting to preach tomorrow, and I'm going to go this afternoon, we be there early in the morning. She said, now, Tom, said, when they go to pay you, don't you let them pay you in chickens. we got more chickens running around the yard than we can feed. So uh, there's a lot of good stories about, about the family and about the Jews. <clears throat> but there was a there was a bunch of them. And, uh, Aunt Lou had uh, brother Claude Hughes and and Will, and Will Hughes. I have the uh, Claude Hughes flag that was draped over his casket when he uh, was buried, <clears throat> and it's forty eight stars. It's not fifty; it was forty eight. And I have it in the courthouse at Blair. Got fond memories of it. And Aunt Lou Ash. Uh, <clears throat> she was my mother away from home. Even though I lived at the Smith house, <clears throat> she fed me too. 
she was a dandy. Uh, when the bride would go to the Baptist church, I'd tell them, I'd say, well, now, today I'm going with my aunt to the Methodist church. Yeah. And Lou told me, she, I know how strong she is. I know how strong the Hughes are. And she told me, boy, you're going to church with me Sunday? I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and she, she'd take me to church. She'd feed me, too. Any time I went down there, I got food. And uh, <clears throat> she'd take care of me when I'd get to the theater. Uh, I didn't have a money in my pocket. She said, come on in here, boy. I'll take care of you. I remember when we were playing baseball here, Jack Roberts. I mean, remember Jack Roberts. Yeah, okay. Uh, he was the coach. <coughs> we were playing the baseball tournament in Winder. And I'll, I've always liked chili dogs. So I ate a chili dog or two or three, maybe down there, and I got food poisoned. I thought I was going to die. Well, the next day, Aunt Lou got word of it. And some lady across the street from her down here on Park Street, can't remember her name. When you get my age, you have a hard time remembering. I've got the age that when I go to the post office, I take my wife with me. I know the way that she goes the way back to the house. But anyway, they got a hold of me being sick, and we had to play baseball that night in Winder again. And so they doctored me all day long. They went to the drugstore and got something that made me well in a hurry. Aunt Lou was taking care of me. Aunt Lou was taking care of me. She took care of me all the time, and I just loved her to death. And uh, it's it's a great tribute to that y'all did tonight for Aunt Lou Ash, and she'll always be a member in my heart. Ash's children is still living, and that's Virginia Ash McAllister. She's uh, still living. She is to be 90. Is that correct? Really, yeah. But anyway, she's in Smyrna, Georgia. She's listed. She's with it, and would love to hear from the line of people. Do you have her address? Yes, yeah, I'll give it to you. I'd like to have it. Okay, I'll give it to you. Okay. She may be the one that said she couldn't stand the smell of popcorn because she smelled it all over the gym and died at the holiday and she couldn't stand it anymore. I've just enjoyed sharing this story with you tonight and for doing it, the uh, society is sending me on a nice trip. And I, I think they are because I heard one of them say, why don't we tell him just to get out of here? <laughs> We'd like to give our host a uh, nice uh, gift as a token of our appreciation. This is one of our limited edition Cunningham prints that uh, we sell over at the old jail there. So we enjoy it, Larry. Thank you Thanks so much. much. My pleasure. I'm, I've wanted one of those all the way that I was going to steal it, but now. <laughs>